moment in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, and we humble our hearts before you because this is your word, Lord, that we're talking about. This is your revelation of yourself to us. And so we take that with all sobriety, Lord. And we want to receive from you that spiritual nourishment, Lord, that you designed it to be. So I pray for each and every one that's watching right now and those that will watch at some point in time, Lord, and pray that uh, this study uh, meets them exactly where they're crying out right now, that they would know you, Lord, as the answer to their prayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so 1 John chapter 4. For the, the third chapter ended speaking about it's a spirit that he's given us that abides in us. So he, he introduced this concept of the spirit abiding in us. And that's kind of where he's going to pick it up here in chapter 4 with a warning. And the warning that he gives believers is this. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's a warning that you're going to hear lots of spiritual stuff out there. People have all sorts of opinions, imaginations, fantasies, all these things about the spiritual realm, about the spiritual world. And he says, therefore, you have to test them. You have to test these spirits. Now, there are many spirits out there that will oppose your faith and some in subtle ways and other in not so subtle ways. So therefore, we have to test them because true prophets give true teachings about a true Jesus. False teachers give false teachings about a false Jesus. So we've got to test these spirits. It's exactly how Satan began with Adam and Eve. He said, has God really said so he challenged that, and they were supposed to test that spirit, test that to see if um, God really had said what the devil was claiming he said. So uh, there's this call to test these spirits, and in verse 2 it says, by this you know the spirit of God. So he's giving you what the test is. So here's the test. Here's how you test the spirits. And I would say there's probably more to it than this, but this is certainly without question the beginning point for testing the spirits. He says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Okay, now, there was a day where Muhammad said an angel or a spirit appeared to him and where he first thought it was a demon he was then later convinced it was an angel of the Lord, an angel of God. And what did that spirit tell him? Well, one of the things it told him was that God has no son. God has no son. Now, what does this tell us is a test of the spirit? You have to confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He's come in the flesh. That spirit is of God. Okay? So, um, so obviously, that doesn't pass that test. Now, um, verse 3, we read this. It says, And every, every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So it's the spirit of Antichrist that actually says that Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. So here is the Apostle John, and he's largely probably speaking against the opponents of his day, which were the Gnostics and the Docetists. The Docetists, I believe I have it in your notes there, if you're looking for the spelling. And they primarily would teach that Jesus was a spirit and not a man. So here, Paul, uh, here John's trying to refute that by saying, test the spirits by seeing... The Spirit has to say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. It's exactly what the Docetists and the Gnostics would not say. They believe flesh was evil, flesh was bad, and God would never wrap himself up in something bad and evil. So he probably has those folks in mind when he writes this. Now what about today? 
We don't really have that going on today. You know what we have going on today is pretty much the opposite. What we have going on today is people that claim that Jesus Christ wasn't really a spirit. He was merely a man. He was just a good teacher, a great prophet, or something like that. And that goes against the very first uh, chapter of this book, the very first four verses of this book, which says, that which we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands and heard with our ears concerning the word of life, that life was manifested, became flesh. And um, John's other book, the Gospel of John, he says that uh, the word of God was manifested. Uh, he tabernacled amongst us. He, 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 the word became flesh. So um, in Romans chapter one, Paul actually gives you a great picture of both of these realities. In Romans chapter one, as Paul is introducing Jesus for the very first time to the Roman world, he says that Jesus was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's how you introduce a man. You know, men and women are born, born according to the seed of their parents and grandparents and great grandparents great-grandparents according to the flesh and that's what he says Jesus was he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh but then he says he was also declared to be the son of God through power of the Holy Spirit by the resurrection from the dead so now that separates Jesus this this figure on earth that was clearly man because when you whipped him he bled he would cry out with hunger and thirst and being tired and he would get angry and he had all this humanness about him, yet he also walked on water and fed the 5,000 and raised the dead and healed the blind and the deaf and the lame and so forth. He was certainly God as well. So John is addressing the Gnostic and the Docetist problems of his day where they're saying he only appeared to be a man. He was a spirit. Now, if he only appeared to be a man, why do we need to fight that battle that he, that he was more than spirit, he was also flesh and he was also man? Because a sacrifice for our atonement requires the shedding of blood that a spirit wouldn't have. He has to become a man so that he can shed the blood where the book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So he had to put on human form, had to be flesh and blood. And, and uh, the atonement for the world, past, present, and future, he would also have to be God to have the capacity to do that. So... This is immediately rebuking the Gnostics and the Docetists, but at the same time, we need to refute those who would say Jesus was merely a man and not a spirit. Now, when we test these spirits, I want you to realize that one of the issues with American spirituality, um, one of them is that we, we don't seem to take spiritual realities as actual realities, that there's actually a spiritual world, world out there. There's actually a devil who hates you out there, that things happen based on these battles of principalities and powers of darkness and higher places that are warring against your soul all the time. So we live in this, uh, I don't believe it unless I see it world. And the Bible's all about the great majority of your life is being played out in the invisible realm. And that's why you've got to understand that there are principalities and powers of darkness in higher places that are against us. And we have Yahweh, El Shaddai, God Almighty, and his son, Jesus Christ, who has guaranteed us victory over all of that. So now, the spirit of Antichrist that he just mentioned doesn't care if you worship Jesus, he only cares that you worship the wrong Jesus. He wants a false Jesus um, for you to be paying all your time and attention to. So what we have to do is make sure that our view of Jesus, how you view Jesus in your heart and mind tonight as we talk about him, is that the true Jesus or have you created a false Jesus in your mind? So we must apply our ideas of God to the scriptures. We cannot make God created in our image. We must uh, uh, humble ourselves till we were created in his. He is a truth that pre-exists us. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us to discover him, to, to not, not to create him in our image, but to discover who he actually is. And that's why I so respect people that show up on Wednesday nights to do just that. 
So you guys always have my respect in that regard. Now, Paul will actually say it's the resurrection. In Romans 1, he'll say it's the resurrection from the dead that is the declaration of God the Father that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God come in the flesh. So what's the greatest proof that he's the Son of God that's come in the flesh? It's the fact that unlike anybody else, there's no religious leader, nobody that's ever started a religion that has ever claimed to have risen from the dead, predicted that he would die and rise from the dead and then show up and have eyewitness testimony and then point you back to scriptures to say, they've been talking about me for centuries. So you can look at your previous scriptures and compare them to me because they're all about me. And then uh, half a dozen times or so in the New Testament, he'll tell his followers, I will be betrayed, I will be arrested, I will be crucified, and I will rise again on the third day. And then he even says to the Pharisees, he says to them, you destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. So he even tells us who is going to be responsible for his death. Okay, so he, he got the people responsible right, he got the third day resurrection right, and he got that he would have a premature death uh, of martyrdom right. Okay, so moving on to verse 4. It says, you are of God, little children. Now, this is directly opposed to the spirit of Antichrist being already in the world. So there's a spirit of Antichrist out there, and he says, you are of God. So the Apostle Paul is crystal clear on this spiritual realm, isn't he? He's saying there's a spirit of Antichrist and people that follow him, and, that you, and you are the children of God. So there's the, the battle lines are drawn in the spiritual realm there. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, I use that verse very, very often in counseling. People need to know if you're a Christian being counseled, you have victory. You just have to walk in it. You walk out your victory rather than being a victim. You step out in what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf because if he's abiding in you, and that word's going to come up a lot tonight, that word abide. God's constantly trying to tell us that he's abiding in us. He's here. And greater is he who is here than he who is in the world. So the greater ought to defeat the lesser every time. The only way the greater won't defeat the lesser is if you don't have the greater show up for the battle. Okay? So he says you have overcome them because greater is he who is you than he who is in the world. Now, and when John wrote his gospel... In John's Gospel, chapter 1, in verse 5, he says this. He talks about the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Did not overcome it. So he, he compares the spiritual battle between a battle between light and darkness. And he says, Jesus is the light. The darkness did not uh, overcome it. Did not comprehend it. Did not overcome it. Have you ever seen darkness overcome light? Have you ever seen lights on and then somebody just comes and switches a, switches a switch? I almost said switches a flip. Flips a switch and all of a sudden darkness overcomes the light. No, you have to remove the light to have any chance for darkness to win in, in, in a room. Okay, But the presence of light will never allow darkness to exist. So light always overcomes darkness, John 1 says. And now he says this, greater is he who is in you, the light, than he who is in the world, the darkness. And it says, you little children have overcome them. He's comparing how light overcomes darkness to how you overcome he who is in the world. You squash him. You win every time. You win the way light defeats darkness. You're the light, and he's the darkness. And when light shows up, it never loses. Okay? So Christians have confidence and fear doesn't have a, a place here. Fear doesn't have a place here because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Does that mean things are easy? No. But is there victory? Yes. Always there's victory. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes like Joseph, you got to sit in a jail cell for two years before you receive it because God's working on you through that stuff. He's still working on you during your jail time or your whatever. But Joseph had the victory after the two years. We'll have the victory either immediately or at some point or time. So, verse 5. They are of the world. 
Therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, even though I teach at a covenant school, we don't necessarily have all our classrooms filled with covenant kids. And I can tell you that when I teach like I'm teaching right now, I can see those who are rejecting it in their hearts. I can see those who are not letting it near them. And this says they're of the world and therefore they don't hear you. So they, Jesus will say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's not for you to check the sides of your head to say, I have ears to hear, so I should be hearing. No, he's talking about there has to be a condition of your heart that he taught in the parable of the sower. You gotta be that good, rich soil that when he sows these seeds, there's gonna be a crop that comes from it. And the challenges to you being that good soil are the riches of the world that can choke it out. It's the worries of the world that can cause it to not have a lot of depth to it. Or it could just be Satan who takes those seeds as soon as they're sown, okay? So you gotta watch out for Satan. You gotta watch out for riches. You gotta watch out for worries. All those things squash the word of God in your heart, okay? So he says, we have overcome them. We have overcome them. That is a definitive statement of victory already accomplished. A definitive statement of victory already accomplished. We, we just have to walk in it. Uh, you have overcome them because he who is in you. Now, who gets the glory for these victories? It says you've overcome them because of because he who's in you. That's why you've overcome them. Because he who is of you is the one that's greater than he who's in the world. And they're of the world. They speak of the world and the world hears them. Why do they speak as, as the world? Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, correct? So when they speak as of the world, it's because the world's in their heart. So we have to guard our hearts with fervency. So what are you listening to all day long? What are you watching all day long? What are you reading, okay? What's the news of the world doing to you in your heart? Because that's gonna become your speech pretty soon and it's gonna be how the world knows you is through that speech, okay? So we have to guard our hearts. Listen, we have to purify our hearts. Think of all the impurities that are getting into our hearts all the time. Psalm 24 says this, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may dwell in his tabernacle? You know what the answer is? He who has clean hands, that means your deeds are holy, and he who has a pure heart. So what's going on with your hearts tonight? What are you letting into your hearts? We need to be purifying our hearts. We need to be guarding our thought life fervently because things are all around us bombarding our thought life, trying to make them impure. And those impurities cannot get up the, the hill of the Lord. Where, he, where the Lord is, is pure light. He dwells in purest light. And we've got to purify ourselves. Now, ultimately, as we journey through the mud here, trying to purify ourselves, we have to remember confession of sin is what cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Confession of sin cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So when we do have these impure thoughts or deeds, we are con just a confession of that sin away, a humbled heart, uh, a contrite spirit that leads to confession, that leads to cleansing, and then we're back on track again. Now, now when we talk about, it says, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And you're gonna hear this word abide come up a lot in this chapter. Here's what I wanna show you. How important to Jesus was this abiding? Well, in John 6, he'll say this, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Now, that's a very troubling statement. I don't know how you and I would have fared if we were in that crowd. We would have looked at each other and said, is he promoting cannibalism? That's the only thing I know eating flesh and drinking blood is about is cannibalism. And he doesn't bother explaining himself. He wants to see who's going to stick around even when they're confused about him. So when you get confused about God, do you leave? Like it said, many left him that day. Many walked away from him that day. In fact, it's 
It's the 66th verse of John chapter 6. It's the only 666 in the New Testament. And what does it say? Many, walk, many would walk with him no longer. The work of the devil is not for you to be murdered or slaughtered in the street. The work of the devil is for you simply to walk with him no longer. That is all Satan needs to do. He doesn't need your life to be horrible. He doesn't need, he doesn't need to make you poor and hungry and destitute and haunted by demons. He only needs you to walk with the Lord no longer, and that's it, and he wins. Now, Jesus in John 13 points to a loaf of bread. He says, this is my body. Great relief comes over the apostles because they look at that and say, I can eat that. I'm so glad that that's your body. He holds up wine. He says, this is my blood. And they had to say, thank God that's your blood because I can drink that. But they had to make it from John 6 to John 13, didn't they? That's a long period of time from the life, in the life of the apostles from John 6 to John 13. And that time was filled with this. It was just filled with, you know, how many conversations do you think they have with each other going, are you actually going to bite his arm or his leg when he tells us to eat his flesh? Where, where are you going to bite, you know, type of thing. But they finally get to John 13, and the relief comes that he means communion. But are you the type of person that can make it from John 6 to John 13, saying, I know who he is, so no matter what crazy ideas I have about what he's doing or saying, in our world, it's like, how could people go to hell, or how could this, or how could that? We don't have all those answers, but here's what we do know. We do know him, and what he's saying is, I've done enough that you can hold on for your entire lifetime trusting me. I've done enough to earn your trust so that in your confusing moments, you hang on, because one day you'll have all your answers, won't you? And hopefully you've hung on dear enough to make it to that day. Now, speaking of the Lord's Supper, Paul will say to the Corinthians, you have to examine yourself. You have to examine yourself before you partake of this, before God abides in you. What, what, how serious is Jesus about abiding? He actually gives us food and drink and says, it's my body and my blood, consume it and understand that I'm abiding in you. Now, Paul says, examine yourself before you partake of that. And what are you to examine? You're to examine to see if you're in the faith or not. So how do you know? He says, do not partake of this in an unworthy manner. Do not eat this bread or drink this wine in an unworthy manner. So how do you know if, if you're doing it in an unworthy manner or in a worthy manner? Well, I'm going to tell you my best understanding of it is this. You become worthy of the incredible holiness of the body and blood of the Son of God only when you realize that you're entirely not worthy of the body and the blood of the Son of God. Your worthiness for that supper is found in your recognition of your unworthiness. Let me say that one more time. Your worthiness to partake of the Lord's Supper comes when you fully recognize that you're not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. That humility of the holiness of that event is what we need to meditate upon when we're taking the bread and the wine. Now, how many people do you see leave your church when they announce communion? They want to beat the traffic. They want to, you know, get a jump on the day. They heard the message. They did the worship. They don't want to spend the extra 15, 20 minutes waiting for a wafer and, a, and some grape juice. So they leave. Happens every single time at our church. I don't know about your churches. And that is awful. Jesus said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. You guys should be counting down the days till the next communion service. Excitedly counting those days down. Excited to partake of the body and the blood of the Lord. Um, the, probably the thing I appreciate most about my Catholic days was the priest getting fed up with people leaving before the Eucharist. And he ended up putting a sign over the exit door that simply said this, Judas left early too. Okay? <laughs> and I promise you if I ever start a church, before I even get a pew, I'm putting that sign over the exit. All right. Now, I don't even know where I am. All right, let's see. I think I'm on verse 7. Sounds good to me, right? Verse 7. All right. 
Verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. All right, now, verse seven starts with, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Now, where it says, let us love one another, in the Greek, it's actually agapatoi agapamen. And what that means in Greek is this, I like it better than this English translation. It says, those who are loved, let us love, okay? So it says, there are those who are loved, and, and sometimes you get the word beloved, they're the beloved of God. Those that are loved, let us love. So here's a call to love the brethren. This is a call to love the brethren, all right? Why? For love is of God. So why are we called to this love? Because a further proof of authentically being of God is our love towards our brothers and sisters in the Lord. If love is of God, then those who claim to be born of God and claim to know God will show forth this love as the fruit from God. So in other words, God is looking for his people to have external evidence of the inward realities. So the inward reality of Christ abiding in us is seen in the outward taking of the bread and the cup. So the inward reality of you dying to self and, and becoming a new creation in Christ is your baptism. That's the outward sign. So the outward sign that you're the children of the God who is the God of love is that you love, okay? So I remember early in my teaching career, somebody saying, hey, every time you think, you lick your mustache when I had a goatee. I would lick my mustache when I think, and I immediately knew, that's my father. I learned that from my father. Every time my father thought, he would lick his mustache as he was thinking, okay? That was the evidence that I am my father's son. Evidence that you are God's child is that you love, because he's a God of love. It's an outward sign of who's your father is, of who your father is. Now, the word know, when it says you, uh, you know God, if you love, is the word gnosko. Now, gnosko doesn't mean just this head knowledge. You learn this in your head. That's not good enough. That's what James says in James chapter two, that demons have accomplished that. They have this head knowledge. Okay, the head knowledge is not enough. It's about actually, Gnosko is actually experiencing God through his love for us and our love for each other. If we only receive his love without actively going out and loving others, we will be like the Dead Sea. If you heard Pastor Doug talk about the reality of the Dead Sea, it only receives, it only receives from other water sources. It has no outlet, it has nothing to give. So therefore, everything's dead in there and there's no life in the Dead Sea. There's no life in us if we don't love because the evidence that God is our father is that he's the God of love and his offsprings become people of love, okay? So as we receive his love, we must have an outlet for that love and that certainly becomes ministry and service and kindness and all of those things um, is what allows us not to become dead in our faith. Um, James says, um, faith without works is dead because those works are the outpouring of your love towards others. All right, let's go on to, in verse nine, it says, in verse nine says, in this the love of God was manifested towards us. The love of God is manifested towards us. This is your John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, how is it manifested? That Jesus Christ is dying for you, right? He's dying because of God's great love for the world. Um, this love is also seen in Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul will go on to say, 
you know, for a good person, somebody might dare to die and stuff like that. But Christ, uh, God demonstrated his love that while we were sinners, he didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. It's his great love for us. And one of the great demonstrations of God's love in the Bible is seen through what we call the principle of first occurrences, which basically means the first time a major theme appears in the Bible, that's the major framework for understanding that theme throughout the rest of the Bible. Well, the first time the word love ever appears in the Bible isn't until Genesis, is it 17 or 22? I'm mixing up those stories, but it's 17 or 22 chapters into Genesis where Abraham's sacrificing Isaac, his son. And the first time you ever hear the word love, never with Adam and Eve, okay, never, never in, in, in any story until you get to Abraham and it's not his love for Sarai or anything like that or his wife or anything like that. It said, it's God saying to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love and sacrifice him to me on the mountain of which I will tell you. It's the first time we ever hear the word love in the Bible. And it's the love of a father and the need to sacrifice him. How painful is the Bible presenting love there to us? Now, what about in the New Testament? What, what's the first time we see love? Well, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel, the first time we see the word love is at Jesus' baptism, where Jesus is being baptized and you hear the Father's voice from heaven say, this is my son whom I love. It's in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and, and Luke's gospel. This is my son whom I love. And what about John's gospel? Well, the first time we hear the word love in John's gospel is for God so loved not his son, now it says, for God so loved the world that he gave the son of his love up so that he would have to die for the love of his people. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get, this is my son whom I love, this is my son whom I love, this is my son whom I love. And then in John's gospel, but he loves us so much that he sent that son of his love to his death that you may be saved. Now, when this says God is love, says God is love, that's what we're talking about, is that type of intensity of love. And then he says this, because he first loved you, now you go love like that. And greater love is no man than this, than he'd be willing to lay down his life for his friends. That's what we're talking about when we talk about knowing God's love, experiencing it, gnoscoing it, not just head knowledge of it. It's gotta be better than that. All right, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. Now, right there, you're going to go, what about Moses saw him face to face? What about, and you'll have all these instances of, didn't they see God? And here in the New Testament, John says, nobody's seen God at any time. So how do we understand that? Well, I would suggest to you that every time Moses or anybody like that sees God, Samson's parents said they saw God, that that was not the father, that was the son. That was what we call a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And some of those have great evidence that it could only be Jesus, especially Samson's parents. It could only be Jesus that appeared to them as the angel of the Lord. Why? Because he actually jumps on their altar of sacrifice and ascends to heaven in the flame. So he's saying there, I'm your sacrifice. Okay, not this goat that you're gonna offer. I'm your sacrifice. Only Jesus can say that he's our sacrifice. And then when they asked his name, he said, why do you ask my name? Knowing that it's wonderful. And didn't Isaiah said, he shall be called wonderful. Okay. So, so uh, those are Christophanies about seeing God face to face. So this is talking about the father. Nobody's seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Let's look at this perfecting of love in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we, we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Now, in 
verse 11. Verse 11 sets up these verses that I just read. It says, if God so loved us, we ought, to, we ought also to love one another. Okay, we ought to also love one another. Now, this is kind of like the law of cause and effect. So we have an effect that needs a cause. Why are you to love one another? Because there's a cause for your love. The cause for your love is great. God's great love for you. God's great love for you. When you realize somebody that you're entirely impressed with actually loves you, you actually become more loving to others because of the joy of their love. That's to be your permanent mindset for throughout life as a Christian. God's overwhelming love for you is the cause of the effect of you going out and loving others. You know, forgiveness works the same exact way. Forgiveness works off of cause and effect. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable about a king who forgave an unforgivable debt. He tore it up and said, you owe me nothing. And the person that received that forgiveness became unforgiving to somebody with a much smaller debt. And so the king said, how could you who've received so much forgiveness not have in your heart to offer a little forgiveness to somebody in need who needed your forgiveness? And the scary part of that parable is Jesus said, that that king threw that unforgiving servant into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth until he could pay the whole debt and the debt was unpayable. That's a description of hell. And then he, Jesus finishes by saying, and so will my father do to each one of you who doesn't forgive from his heart. So Jesus is saying the cause of God's forgiveness should have no other effect than you but that you are willing to forgive the things done to you. The same works with love. God's love is so overwhelming for us that if you truly received it, the effect is going to be that you're loving towards others. We love because he first loved us. It's not that we owe him and we're paying him back. It's that his love is transformational. His love is perfected in us. His love is perfected in us and the perfection of God's love don't you agree, would certainly lead to us loving others. Otherwise, it's not so perfect, is it? The perfection of that love is that um, we, we take that love and love others. All right. Now, in verse 15, it said, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him, him and he in God. So he says, listen, the evidence, the internal evidence of God's abiding in you externally is seen through and heard through your confession that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. This brings us to Matthew 16. And I'm going to go there if you want to join me in Matthew chapter 16. This is an extremely important section of the New Testament. Matthew 16 beginning in verse 13 is where we'll start. And it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of God, I'm sorry, the son of man am? So they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you, who do you say that I am? Now I don't believe there's any pop quizzes at the pearly gates. But if there is one, I would have you be ready to answer that question. That's the question I think is the most likely to be, question to be asked at the pearly gates. Who did you say Jesus was? And remember, Jesus will say, if your answer is Lord, there's a cause and effect relationship with calling him Lord. He'll say, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? So, the effect of calling him Lord is obedience to the one that you're calling Lord. Because Lord means master. Master means you're in charge. So if he's in charge, then let him be in charge. Our obedience is directly correspondent to our blessing. Did you know that's a principle in the Bible? Your obedience is directly relational to your obedience. How many times do you hear in the Bible God say, if you do such and such, then I will, and there's a blessing. But if you don't, then there's a cursing. Okay, he's saying he's looking for obedience. Why? Because obedience to God is acknowledgement that he is who he says he is, and that his son is who he 
says the Son is. So obedience is another outward sign of the inward reality of Jesus actually being your Lord, being your master. Okay, now something I want to point out about this, I think is very important. Let's read through it real quick. Um, He said, but who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. He started this section as Simon. Now he's Peter. He started as Cephas. Now he's Petros. Okay, Jesus changes his name. But here's what I want to point out. What's exactly parallel in this passage is Peter's confession saying, you are the Christ. And it's as if Jesus pointed right back to him and says, then you are Peter. So Peter couldn't become Peter, who he actually is, the rock, until he acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ. If you're going to be Peter the rock, then you need to know that I'm Jesus the Christ. And until you acknowledge that I'm Jesus the Christ, then you're just Cephas, which means sand. You're just sand. What does Jesus teach about sand? Build your house on the sand, storm comes, great destruction of of your house, right? You don't want to be sand. You want to be the rock. So it's not until he can say, I realize who you are, you're Jesus the Christ. Now Jesus can finally say, then now you just realized who you are, you're Peter the rock. You will not have your true identity in this world until you identify yourselves with Jesus Christ. That's the only way you'll ever have full realization of who you are. Who you are is actually a child of God. Until you live out your identity as a child of God, you are living in hypocrisy. You are living in compromise. You have to live who you actually are, the child of God. And when you can look at Jesus Christ and say, you're the Christ, and you acknowledge that in front of people, then you'll be acknowledged in front of the angels of heaven by Jesus Christ as his, okay? So your identity, your true identity doesn't come until you recognize and realize and acknowledge and proclaim his true identity. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. All right. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. All right, let's unpack these couple verses here. Here's how love has been perfected in us, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So there's a judgment day. And how has love perfected us? It's perfected us in that we can face that judge with boldness and confidence that we will receive grace in our time of need. Your biggest time of need is going to be your judgment day. And you're going to need grace upon grace on your judgment day. And it says you can enter into that judgment day with boldness. Why? Because love which God is and abiding in you has been perfected in you, okay? And that perfected love casts out the fear of your judgment, okay? So so Christians ought not be afraid of death. Now listen, death will always be sad because we leave loved ones behind and we say goodbye to loved ones. It's very, very sad, but it is not tragic. It is not tragic. It is, it, 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 it's the fulfillment of all of God's work in people's lives is fulfilled through death. So much so that the psalmist will write in Psalm 116, verse 15, he'll say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's precious in his sight. Why? Because it fulfills all of his work uh, from Genesis to Revelation. It's fulfilled in our deaths. So our deaths become a fulfillment rather than a finish. 
They are not a finish of anything. They're a fulfillment of everything. Everything you are supposed to be. All the love you are supposed to experience, all the joy, all the freedom from disease and sickness and crying and pain, all the freedom from the toils of, and struggles of this world, all of that is, all of the freedom from that is fulfilled in our deaths. Now, should we seek our death prematurely? No, because he has prepared good works for you to walk in. He's prepared you to participate in the kingdom work. Somewhere along the line, there's kingdom work that brought you your salvation. There was work done by priest or neighbor or somebody that they were doing the work of the Lord that got you to open up your heart to the Lord. Well, what if God just keeps taking people as soon as they're saved? Okay, a pastor friend of mine always used to wonder that. When he got saved, he's like, can't I just go now? Can't I just go now? And now he realizes as a pastor, no, there's a whole heck of a lot of work to do for others and having our love perfected in us. We gotta get this love perfected. It's perfected through sharing God's love with other people. All right, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love him who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. All right, so here we have, we, there, there's a test. And the seen, the visible is the test. It tests your ability to respond to the unseen, okay? So if you cannot love your brother who you can see, he's visible, and you're under the command to love him and you can't, that means you don't love God who you cannot see. So, so the visible world is our testing ground for the invisible world. We see this even in the commandment to honor your mother and father. Now, I can't promise you what I'm about to say is true. It's just a conclusion I've made over the years as I teach teenagers and one of the greatest commandments they violate regularly is the command to honor their mother and father. They have trouble even obeying them and honoring them is a higher call than just obeying them. So I will often say to them that your parents are your visible testing ground where God commands you to honor them because you can see them. And once you leave your parents home and you're out on your own, the question is, can you honor God who you cannot see? Well, how are you gonna honor that which you cannot see if you didn't honor that which you could see? You could see they provided for you. You could see they were feeding you. You could see that they provided shelter and security and medical insurance and all that for you. You could see all that and you failed to honor them. What makes you think now, this God that you cannot see, you're gonna give honor to throughout your life? So we need to train our children to respond to the visible in the way we want them to respond to the invisible. Because according to this dynamic here, with love, if you're not loving those that you can see, John calls you a liar for claiming that you love God. He says you're a liar. Why? Because if you're a Christian, God abides in you, and God is love, therefore love abides in you. So how in the world is it that that love is not getting out of you to other people, is the question. So John, directly attaches your love for your neighbor with your the reality of the God of love abiding in you and me. So is this just theory? Is this just teaching? Is this just lessons from pen to paper? Not when you have the Son of God manifested in the flesh dying on a cross because of his great love for us, that he loves the, ob the objects of, of his love so much that he had to have a moment of breathing his last and surrendering his spirit to God and dying and being confined to a cold tomb for three days. So God is love and it's not just that, he loves from a distance, he loves us face to face and the cross that we wear around our neck is your everyday reminder that the object of this divine love is you and it's me. So with that, may we never ever look at a cross without our hearts being moved, without it being a love letter from, you, from God to you, and that his love moves your heart to action, to loving your neighbor. In that, the world will know that you're a Christian 
and they will also know that Christianity is of the highest ethic that they've ever experienced. Let's pray. God, it's in Jesus' name that we come to you, Lord, and we pray that because we spent time in your word, that your love would be perfected in us, and there's people in our day tomorrow that will directly benefit from the overflow of your love spilling out through us to other people in radical ways that draw attention to you and your great love for them. Lord, help us. Help us to hear your voice, Lord. Help us to not hear the world and all of its claims and all of its screaming and hollering at us in all these different directions. But we wanna hear you. Purify, Lord, our hands and our minds and our hearts so that we may ascend the hill of the Lord and dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, the work that you began in us, we know you'll be faithful to complete. And in that, we rejoice and we praise you for that. And we rest our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Pastor Bill, we do have our first question. Uh, the question says, uh, earlier you were referencing Cephas, meaning sand. Uh, this person had never heard of that. When they looked it up, they said it meant rock. Uh, so could you review that a little bit with them, Sure. So the, the, what's going on here, and this has been one of the great divides between the Catholic and Protestant church is literally these verses here we're, we're going through in Matthew. And the idea is that Cephas um, is talking about, see the difference between Cephas and Petros, and I wanna make sure I get this right, and I wrote it down in Matthew 16, so let me turn there real quick. All right. Um, Petros, um, let me read this here. I wrote it sideways, so excuse me one second. Okay, so the idea is that, yeah, so Cephas and Petros both being rock, but the Petros is talking about like a boulder and Cephas is the pebbles. So I think, I think the pebbles could be, uh, is a reference to sand type of thing. And where the, where the debate is um, over on this is this is where the Catholics declare Peter to be the first Pope. And it's because Jesus says in the verses that follow, he says, he says, um, he says, you are Peter, and that's Petros, and on this rock, that's Petra. Okay, so one ends in R-O-S, and the other ends in R-A. So Jesus is mentioning two different things here. So what he, and what he's mentioning is, he's saying that your name is Petros, and on this Petra, I shall build my church. So the Catholic faith believes that Peter is being declared the first Pope because in verse 19, Jesus says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So they're saying those keys were given to Peter of the binding and loosing, and that's the authority uh, of the Pope. So Peter's declared to be the first Pope and all the Popes follow from the line of Peter. Now what Protestants believe is that the, the play between Petros and Petra there, the play between those two uh, words there, is Jesus is saying that Peter is the rock, the boulder, and upon this Petra, which is like the little stones, um, in fact, what I wrote in my Bible, and I don't know who I'm quoting there, I'd have to see what commentary I was looking at, but he's saying you're the little stones of like a quarry of rocks. So upon this quarry of little rocks, I'm gonna build my church. And those rocks, would refer to us, the believer. We become the quarry of rocks upon which Jesus will build his church, not just Peter, because if it was Peter, it should read this. You, you are Petras, and upon this Petras, I will build my church. But he doesn't keep the masculine Petras going. He goes to the feminine word Petra, which is different. The Petra was referring to like a rock quarry, a multitude, so it'd be like a community of rocks, which would be the believers. 
And Peter, the very rock that he's referring to here, when he writes 1 Peter, when he writes the letter, he seems to have that in mind because he says this, we are all living stones in the building of God's church. We are all living stones. So he seems to be recalling this moment in Caesarea Philippi where he gets these two different words, Petra and Petras, and he realizes that there's this Petras upon which the church will be, I'm sorry, this Petra on which the church will be built and, um, and that would be all the little believe the, the believers. So probably little stones would be better than sand, uh, especially with the analogy I gave with uh, you, build, you build upon the sand, you collapse, and that's certainly not the church because in this passage, it'll actually say that the gates of hell cannot prevail against this church, okay? So it's certainly one that stands. Um, so uh, sand probably isn't the best word to use there. We have the next question here that is in reference to verse number six from tonight's teaching. Um, it's basically saying here that by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Uh, is this the Holy Spirit giving you the gift of discernment? Uh, I would certainly say that is the source. And um, I actually wrote this reference down, but I didn't put it in the notes. I wrote it in my Bible, and I think it's extremely important is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So when you ask if um, the, the source is the Holy Spirit, is that what they're asking? Is that what that's referring to the Holy Spirit? That's what it's asking, Mike? Yes, All right. if that's referring to uh, okay. discernment from the Holy Spirit. I believe so, because I think 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 10, will say exactly that, what, what the person asking the question is saying. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 says, but God has revealed these mysteries to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So that's directly attributing uh, spiritual wisdom to the Holy Spirit uh, abiding in us. So I think... I think that's the answer would be yes, that that would be uh, the Holy Spirit in, in 1 John there. And it's kind of neat to think about because it's saying, so when, in our passage when it says that um, the world can't hear us because uh, we speak, they speak the things of the world and therefore they can't hear what we're saying because we speak the things of God, I think that's exactly saying the same things as 1 Corinthians chapter 2 which is saying you have to have the spirit of God in you to understand the mind of God. So if you don't have the spirit of God and people are speaking the things of God, you're just not going to understand it. You're not going to follow that. Um, it's not an intellectual disability. It's a spiritual disability that you can't spiritually discern the things of God because you don't have that Holy Spirit in you that knows the mind of God. That's telling you the mind of God in you. That's why you guys can look at creation and go, God is awesome. Everybody else looks at creation and goes, molecules to man. What a random freak accident that was. Okay, they just can't see or hear what you see and hear. Again, that's why Jesus will say things like, he who has eyes to see, let him see. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying that it takes a special kind of seeing and hearing to understand the things of God. Uh, they're not naturally discerned. They're supernaturally discerned. So you need the Holy Spirit in you to be able to discern those things. Let's get to uh, another question here that says, do you quote unquote feel love for God in the same sense as you love your wife or kids, for example? I need him above all else. I'm in awe of him. I fear and worship him. But sometimes I, I have the feeling of love for him, but not always. I'm thankful for that question. Thankful for that question. And um, uh, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of pressure from this side to say, I love my wife dearly, first of all. Now let me answer the rest of the question. <laughs> so um, why I'm thankful for the question is because I think, I don't know how old I was. I pray I was really young because it sounds really dumb to say, but I remember my parents showing me a picture of Jesus when I was really, really young and saying, we love him. And I remember saying, what if we think he's ugly, okay? So that's how my relationship with Christ started. All right, and thankfully things have gone up a bit since then. 
but and, and I bring that up because if we happen to think he's ugly that and we think we can't therefore love him we misunderstand the love that we're called for God would be I, th I think God would be impinging on the fact that he's created us in his image as free creatures if he commanded us to love, meaning I'm commanding your emotions toward me. I'm commanding you feel something towards me. I believe the love that he's commanding from us is a love that you actually can choose hour by hour by hour throughout your whole life. And that it's not necessarily generated by a feeling that you feel towards him. It's generated by you choosing to put him in front of everything else. That you're choosing to love. When you do wedding vows, you're not vowing to feel a certain way for the rest of your life. That's nowhere in the vows. You're vowing to choose your spouse over everybody else every day of your life. You're making that choice. And I think... It's pretty predictable that feelings will follow the choices that you make. So it's not like you're going to feel this negative way towards your spouse or towards God and you choose to love them anyway and you keep feeling neg the negativity. Your feelings will follow the choices that you make. I think one of the biggest understandings we could ever accomplish is to understand that everybody has the freedom to choose and everybody has... Um, feelings. I think the great majority of people, and I think what's making our nation a mess today is that people are making choices based on feelings. They don't like, they don't like what a, a president says, so they burn down a city because they feel angry. But we need to be led by our choices. We need to choose uh, to be loving towards one another. Um, I don't have to feel love towards a person to choose to be loving towards a person. And I believe the command is coming to us to choose to be loving. And I also believe that when you make that choice towards somebody, you will start to feel love towards them. You got to be led by the choices and let your feelings follow. The huge thing that I think is going wrong with so many people and that confuse people about God is they wonder, are my feelings right? And therefore, they'll make choices based on how they feel. And if they don't feel love towards God, then they feel more comfortable sinning or more comfortable not being loving towards others or more comfortable not going to church or reading their Bible. And they acquire these great comfort levels of not doing things because they go, I just don't feel that way. I don't feel like it. And one of the great tools I have in marriage counseling is saying, let's not, let's not care for a while how anybody feels. Let's live off of choices. Let's choose each other and let's see you behave based on those choices. And then we'll talk about how you feel. But let's see how you feel after making these choices over a season of time. So same with God. I, I choose to love God no matter how I feel. I choose to be obedient to God no matter how I feel. And what I end up feeling is stronger than ever in my emotions towards God. Um, because if he is real and if he is love, then when we obey him, we're, we're operating in love. And I believe feelings of love will follow those choices. The question is, do you have to be baptized to partake in the Lord's Supper? I am getting baptized, but I'm not sure if it's God's calling for me to be baptized or if this is just a passing feeling. Um, you're commanded to be baptized. Um, there's two imperative statements. Imperative statements are commands um, that John the Baptist began with and Jesus followed through with. And that is, he says to all people everywhere, repent, that's a command, it's not a suggestion, and be baptized. That's a command, not a suggestion. So um, I would encourage uh, the questioner to get baptized as soon as you possibly can. You can wait until your church does their next baptism or you can, you know, find a pastor or an elder. And, and uh, I did three baptisms over Christmas break of people just realizing they haven't been obedient to that, wanted to be baptized as soon as possible. And we just jumped in the ocean. I, I prefer you get those ideas in the summer, quite frankly, because uh, the ocean was absolutely frigid uh, going in there in December. But if you do get that idea in the winter, me or somebody else would be more than happy to uh, 
uh, baptize you. But it, it is a command of the Lord. It doesn't save you, but it's the outward picture for the world to see. There's to be witnesses of that um, that hold you accountable to your baptism. That's why I like Calvary's baptisms because there's hundreds and hundreds of people that can see. And what I like to say in the water sometimes is, this is you declaring before all these people that you follow Christ. So if these people, because you know, people are in the condos on their patios watching these baptisms. And I'm like, if they see you get baptized and then tonight you're at the bar over there half drunk, they're going to go, hey, aren't you the guy that just went into the water and got baptized and everything? And now you're getting baptized by liquor and what's up with that? So um, you're to be held accountable by, by the seeing world for that. If you acknowledge God before man, Jesus will acknowledge you before uh, the angels in heaven. If you do not acknowledge him before man, he will not acknowledge you. Baptism is that is one of those acknowledgments. It's a public display um, for people to see. So, um, yeah, so I would encourage that person to get baptized. Now, I think they asked if they could still take the Lord's Supper in the meantime. And you could take the Lord's Supper, it, certainly, if um, you examine yourself and realize you're, if you're confessing your sin, not making excuses for it, you recognize your unworthiness of partaking of the body and the blood. I mean, I, I always want to be in awe of that, the body and the blood of the Son of God, that we're actually partaking of that, um, that sacrament. Um, so if you recognize what that is and feel the unworthiness and the grace that comes with your invitation to partake in that, um, then I think you can partake in the meantime until you get baptized. Uh, this next question is probably a situation that every single person here has been through uh, lately. The question reads, this past election season, I've seen so many people who call themselves Christian uh, post hateful messages against other Christians and so on. How should I look upon those people? Um, you, we should look upon them with love, compassion, forgiveness, but um, also praying about a way privately, I don't think you should ever do this stuff publicly, of saying that um, the Christian part of them that you know and recognize doesn't seem to match the public um, display of, uh, on social media. Just saying I, the way I know you as a Christian doesn't seem to match what I'm seeing uh, in public, you know, type of thing. And... Um, and there's a lot of ways of expressing your disapproval without name calling and insult and all of that. There's lots of ways to express your disapproval. Um, I have a lot of very heavy opinions about politics and none of you have seen a bit of it on social media. To me, it's just not the place. If I saw people being won over by ideas on social media, then I'd be all over it expressing my ideas. I have not seen one person go, thank you so much, I just changed my mind. I just changed my vote. I just changed everything because of your social media post. It's just not gonna happen. The only thing I've ever seen change hearts and minds politically is the gospel. If they get the spirit of God, then they'll, see, they'll understand the mind of God and then they'll take the issues of politics and apply the mind and the spirit of God to those issues, and I think you'll see large agreement there politically uh, in those cases. And in most major issues politically, you do see Christians, majority of Christians on the same side. And I think that's why, quite frankly. But um, and that, it's hard for me to hear anybody justify name calling, um, abusive language, hurtful language, uh, and, and things like that. Um, this is exactly where the call to love your enemy comes in. And, uh, and they were talking about enemies that wanted to kill you, not just disagree with your political ideas. So if you're to love the enemy that wants to kill you, you're certainly to love those who disagree with you politically. So I struggled in my heart looking at that as well. I really have a struggle in my heart. And, um, and I just think it's hard for the unbelieving world to say we're different when that happens. So, um, and I don't, I don't think people need to not express their political ideas. I just think um, if people don't hear from a Christian and say, I know they love me, then those words shouldn't have been said. And what I've seen on social media, and I imagine the questioner's seen on social media, 
you would never guess that they love the person that they're talking about. So uh, the command to love never takes a back seat to a political idea. So um, you can get them both done. You can love and express the political ideas and so forth. So how should we view that? We should view it as somebody who probably, uh, quite frankly, and, and you know, with 40 something people right now looking on is probably addressing somebody here, I would say there needs to be a spiritual rebuke in, in that area. Um, if they claim to be a Christian, there should be spiritual review going to them, in my opinion. And we have the last question of the evening. And honestly, it's just amending the previous question about getting baptized. Would that answer change if you gave? Would that answer change if you were baptized as a child and not as an adult? Yes, great question. Um, now, I know that when I've asked this question to people I respect in the faith, um, the, the pretty common answer, the pretty consistent answer is, if you are baptized by a, an ordained minister of the Lord, then you are good, infant or not infant. Now that was me, I was baptized as a Catholic infant. And knowing what I knew about that answer, I still went as an adult and got baptized because I just wanted with what I came to know of the Lord, I wanted to be in public. I wanted a public display of what I came to know and believe. I wanted my baptism to be my choice, my decision, my commitment. I wanted all that. And so um, I'm, I think that came from the Lord. I think it did. I don't know that it did. But when I'm in the water baptizing and people say I was baptized as an infant, sometimes I'll say to them, I want you to know that I think that was effective for you. Um, but if you choose like I did to still do it because now it's your decision, then I'd be happy to do it. But I do want you to know that I believe that that counted for you. Um, but the fact that you have 25 people with cameras pointing at you is probably not likely you want to turn around and walk out and go, Hey, I already did this. Let's go get breakfast. You're probably going to want to follow through anyway. But, uh, I, I, I don't think that if you were baptized as a child, you need to feel the imperative to do it again. Um, that's the advice that I've received and, and that I go by. If there was an ordained minister of the Lord, you're good. Because you gotta remember this, guys. It's not happenstance that they baptize infants in, in some in Protestant churches and Catholic churches. They have theological reasons behind it that are very, very sound. Um, and we have theological reasons that are very, very sound for baptizing adults and not baptizing infants. And so I can't tell you who's right in that. Um, I will not say that what we do is the market on it and everybody else is wrong. Um, I understand both sides of the argument and I think they're both extremely sound arguments. You do have to be saved first. I do see that question in the chat. Uh, I don't think you'd want to be baptized if you weren't saved. Um, but yes, you have to be saved first. Actually, the comment right before that, Pastor Bill, is an interesting one uh, where it just references the Catholic baptism. Uh, a lot of times that's not a choice. Shouldn't baptism be a choice? Yeah, I mean, Peter says it's the pledge of a good conscience towards God, and I think that's where churches like ours hold on to and say the infant can't have a good conscience towards God. But the people that baptize infants, they see the sacrament of baptism as the New Testament replacement for the sacrament of um, circumcision. So where we don't require circumcision, um, they say it's because um, it's been replaced by baptism. So as infants were circumcised, therefore infants should be baptized. Because they see, and this is why I think their logic is pretty sound, is because what they see is that they were, there were bloody sacraments in the Old Testament. Circumcision was a bloody sacrament, and sacrifice was a bloody sacrament. And those are replaced by non-bloody sacraments in the New Testament because Jesus' blood was enough. So we don't need the blood in our sacraments. So the bloody sacrament of infant circumcision is replaced by the non-bloody infant baptism. And the bloody sacrifice of animals is now replaced by the non-bloody Lord's Supper, partaking of the Lord's Supper. So um, they see those two New Testament sacraments replacing those two Old Testament sacrifices or, or sacraments 
And because circumcision was for infants and its replacement baptism, therefore, is for infants. So that's our justification for that. And if they really, really held to it tightly, then they would be baptizing on the eighth day, but they don't seem to press that um, at all. But uh, they, that's why they baptize infants. And, and I think there's actually a beauty to the, the thought that they have there, um, that the blood has been replaced. Jesus shed the blood, and therefore there's no more shedding of blood for us. And so these are non-bloody ones. But that, uh, and, and they would say, Peter's talking about the fact that um, nobody was an infant when Jesus uh, died and rose again. Uh, in Peter's day, they were all adults when it happened. So therefore, the new believers are adults. And, and so therefore, that's why they're baptizing adults. But a lot of times they'll say and their whole household was baptized with them. And they would say that would imply if they had an infant, they baptize the infant. And therefore, if you have an infant, you should baptize an infant. So they have sound reasoning. They have sound reasoning. Um, and that's why what I say is, my thing is just make sure it's an ordained minister. I don't think you just grab, you know, Joe at, at the bowling alley and say baptize me since you're here you know type of thing but you, you get an ordained minister and, and you're baptized and i see you meeting the requirement uh, pastor will is there any ending thoughts that you'd like to leave us with for the week no just um i hope you're enjoying it i enjoy preparing it um it's it, and uh, great questions i'm i'm always a little bit nervous when we start this because your questions are deep and they're good and um good for you guys um for, for you got to have a really sound foundation to even know the questions to ask that you're, you're that you're asking and I think that's wonderful that you ask these questions so uh, until next week um, just pray God goes with you and that you grow between now and then in your faith through your personal study of the word and through um, the going to church and my heart would just say this make really honor the Lord's Supper I think we need to do a little more reverent job of that uh, a lot of people so I would encourage you in that as well and good night yeah.